Hello, everybody. Welcome to the MIT Category Seminar. This week, we have Maru Sarasola, who's going to talk about two modal structures for double categories. Hello, Maru, and please go ahead. Hi. Uh, thanks, Paolo and Brendan, for the invitation to speak here today. Um, so yes, like Paolo said, um, I'm going to be talking today about joint work with Lynn Moser and Paula Verdugo, where we define two new model structures for the category of double categories. So let me give you a brief outline of how this talk is going to go. I'm going to start us off with some preliminaries just to make sure that we're all on the same page with the basic notions that I'm going to be discussing today. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what the motivation was for defining these model structures. Um, and then we are going to talk about our two model structures. We are going to do a brief comparison if we have the time. And uh, we are going to finish with a whitehead theorem for double categories. So let's begin with the preliminaries. Um, like we said, we're going to be talking about double categories today. So what is a double category? Well, a double category consists of a collection of objects. And then we're going to have two different types of morphisms, which we think as going into different directions. So we'll have what we call horizontal morphisms and vertical morphisms. And what we expect is that these things can be of very different uh, kinds. So horizontal morphisms are going to compose among themselves in a uni unital associative way as usual. Vertical morphisms are going to compose among themselves, but we don't expect to be able to compose a horizontal morphism with a vertical morphism. And instead, the way in which these two types of morphisms are going to be related is through what we call squares. So we have this data of squares, which tells us uh, how the boundary morphisms interact with each other. So I'm going to be showing just one example of double category, but it's a very important one and one that's going to be key for my talk today which is that any two category can be seen as a double category. So just to do a quick recap, what is a two category? Well, the short and quick definition is that a two category is a category enriched in cat. But what does that really mean? It means we have a collection of objects, we have morphisms, and now we're allowed to have a higher level of morphisms between morphisms. So whenever we have two objects A and B and two morphisms from A to B, which we call F and G, we have this notion of morphism, whoops, of morphism from F to G, right? All right, so we were saying any two category can be seen as a double category. So how do we do such a thing? Well, we let the objects of the double category be the same objects as the two category. We put all the morphisms of the two category in the horizontal direction of the double category. We set only identities as vertical morphisms. And then we will have a square like alpha in the picture here, precisely for every two morphism from F to G, right? So we should think of this as a horizontal embedding of the two category into the double category where everything in the vertical direction is made trivial. Any questions at this point? This is gonna be a pretty important point of view. So if anybody has questions, please uh, either raise your hand or write in the chat of Zoom. I'll be monitoring the other channels as well. Okay, thanks, Paolo. I'll let you interrupt me if anyone has questions. I think there are no questions for now, so please go ahead. Right, so let's move on. So this correspondence that takes a two category and embeds it and like makes it a horizontal double category 
can actually be assembled into a functor, which we'll denote by this double H. And this horizontal embedding functor is part of an adjunction. So it emits a left adjoint that will take a double category and basically forget about its vertical structure. So you start with a double category and you construct a two category with the same object with morphisms being the horizontal morphisms and with two morphisms given by the squares like we see in the picture. So we forget about everything that's uh, interesting in the vertical direction. All right, so for the last of our preliminaries, I wanna say a word about model structures, uh, just in case people are maybe not um, super familiar with them. So what, what are model structures good for? Why do a homotopy theorists care about model structures at all? Well, they're good for solving the following kind of problem. Let's suppose that we wanna work with a category that, com that has some class of morphisms, which in the context, context that we are working in, we see as being morally isomorphisms, right? So we have our category, it comes with a class of isomorphisms, which is obviously determined by the structure of the category, but we might be working in a specific context where we want more things to be identified. So for example, imagine we're working with chain complexes of modules, and we only care about doing homological algebra, then we don't really care about distinguishing chain complexes that have the same homology, right? Like in our minds, we want these two things to be the same. However, it's not the case that any two such chain complexes will be isomorphisms. So depending on our context, we might want to upgrade a certain class of morphisms to isomorphisms and then work with what we call its homotopy category. So what is one way in which one can do this? Well, one can define a model structure on the category C, having this class of morphisms that are like morally isomorphisms for us as its class of weak equivalences. So in particular, um, what this will achieve is that the what we call the homotopy category, which is exactly the localization of these uh, moral isomorphisms in the category, will be particularly nicely behaved, right? So anytime you have a distinguished class, you can localize, but the beast that you get might be really difficult to tame. However, if you live in the world of model structures, uh, this is way nicer. So the slogan that we want to keep in mind is that model categories provide a setting where one can do homotopy theory in this manner. So just to quickly uh, mention a few details, but not, um, not too precise. What is a model category exactly? Well, it is a category having finite limits and co-limits uh, to which we attach three distinguished classes of maps. Um, so the first class is the one that we were mentioning right before, which we call weak equivalences. This is, in a way, the most important of the three classes. And then we have two auxiliary classes of fibrations and cofibrations, which are pretty much there to give us the extra structure that will make everything nice. And of course, these classes satisfy a very rigid set of axioms that I'm not going to mention today. Um, so one might wonder what is the right kind of functor between these model categories? And intuitively, one might think that the correct functor is the one that preserves all the structure, right? Which is what we usually do, just have it preserve all three classes. However, in practice, this doesn't happen very often. This is a bit too strong a condition. And so we have two kinds of functors, which we call left quillen functors or right quillen functors. And the right quillen functors will preserve classes one and two, and the left ones will preserve classes one and three. Okay, so we have kind of half of the structure being preserved, but we are good since they always come in adjoint pairs, one of each. So there's really no asymmetry going on here. 
All right, and the slogan that is going to lead the talk today is that every time we have a good class of equivalences, uh, we homotopy theorists like to think that they should be the weak equivalences of some model structure. So if you're not all that comfortable with model structures, you can think of this talk as just the pursuit of some class of good equivalences in double categories. All right, so let's move on to the actual talk. So um, let's talk about the motivation for building these two model structures on double categories. And at this point, I should mention that we were by no means the first people to try to put a model structure on the category of double categories. In fact, there are several such model structures available in the literature by um, Thomas Fiore, Simona Pauli, and Dorat Pronk. So what is it that we wanted to do that none of these model structures achieved? Well, our motivation comes exactly from this horizontal embedding functor from two categories that I was telling you about a few slides uh, previously. So this horizontal embedding can be easily seen to be fully faithful, which means we can consider um, two cat as living inside of double cat, right? And this perspective turns out to be quite useful even if all we care about are two categories. Let me give you a concrete example. One can prove that if we are in two categories, then the two limit of a two functor is not necessarily a two terminal object in the two category of cones over the functor. So this seems a little bit like a tongue twister. Um, let's forget about the twos for a second. What's going on? Um, so if we forget about the twos for a second, um, this phrase would read, the limit of a functor is or is not a terminal object in the category of cones over the functor. And now in categories, we know this to be true, right? We can indeed take this as the definition of the limit over the functor. So it's a bit surprising that this is not true anymore once we attach the two to each word in the statement. Um, but there's a way that we can fix this. Um, use, if we use this horizontal embedding from two cat into double cat and now push our two functor and look at it as a horizontal double functor between HA and HB. Now, it will be the case that a two limit is a double terminal object in the double category of cones over HF. So what's going on here basically is that double cat is not that much harder than two cat in the sense that they're, they're both two dimensional categories, right? In two cat we have globes, in double cat we have squares, but it's all 2D. However, the extra structure that we have in double cats with these two different kinds of morphisms and the squares between them, is going to make it more robust and a bit better behaved than two cat. So the conclusion from that previous slide is that we can study 2CAT categorically by looking at it as if it's living inside of double cat through this horizontal embedding. And the goal of our project is to be able to do this homotopically. So what does this mean exactly? Well, there exists a model structure on 2CAT whose weak equivalences are the bi-equivalences. So what we want to do is define a model structure on double cat such that this horizontal embedding is still nicely behaved, but now homotopically. So this is going to be our aim. Um, and uh, it turns out that unfortunately, none of the previously existing uh, model structures on double cat achieved this purpose. All right, so how do we construct these model structures? Let's talk about the first one. Well, since we're always keeping an eye towards two categories, 
Um, our approach is going to be to try to capture the data that we find in a double category by using two categories. So you can probably be easily convinced that one two category is not enough to capture all the data present in a double category. Uh, so we're going to we're going to need to use two two categories to do that. So what are our candidates? Well, on the one hand, we have this bold H functor. Remember the adjoint to the horizontal embedding, the one that forgets about the vertical data. And this is going to produce two categories that record our objects, our horizontal morphisms, and our squares with vertical identities. So the squares that look like this. So what is the data that we still need to record? Well, the vertical morphisms and all the rest of the squares. So a naive approach, a naive first attempt could be to use the vertical analog. So of course, just like we, just like we can embed a two category uh, horizontally into a double category, we can do all that vertically. And we have an adjoint, which is this bold V, which forgets about the horizontal direction. So these are really the duals to the ones that I've introduced before. And one could think that this might be helpful. However, this is doomed to fail. First of all, we still don't have all the squares, right? Because this V will now give us objects, vertical morphisms in squares that look like this. And our previous functor, bold H, was giving us squares that look like this. However, it is very much not true that from the data of these two kinds of squares, you're able to recover the data of any square that you might have in your double category. This is very false. So we're still missing some data with this functor B. But furthermore, this is doomed to fail from a more meta point of view, because we're seeing that our motivation for constructing this model structure comes from wanting it to be nicely behaved with this horizontal embedding. So our motivation from the go has a very strong horizontal bias. And there's really no way to expect the model structure that we obtain to be fully symmetric with respect to the horizontal and vertical directions, right? That would be very weird, given that our motivation is strongly um, biased towards the horizontal direction. All right, so what can we consider instead of this bold V functor? Well, what we propose is to do a shift down, and instead of considering this uh, two category having objects, vertical morphisms, and squares with trivial horizontal maps, we want to shift down and now have the vertical morphisms be the object of the two category that we produce. So how do we do that exactly? We consider this functor. So here, V2 denotes the double category, which is the walking vertical arrow we are going to take functors um, from B out of V2. So here I'm uh, secretly using the fact that double categories have an internal hum. And then we're going to keep only the horizontal data of that because we want to produce a two category as an output and not a double category, right? So since we're taking maps, out of the walking vertical arrow, the objects will be the vertical morphisms in our double categories. And now, so these will be the objects. And now a morphism between these is going to be just any kind of square. So now we're managing to keep track of all the data with these two functors from double cat to two cat. Okay, so the key will be to use those in order to define our model structure on double cat. But I've been saying from a while ago that we want it to be nicely behaved with some model structure existing on two cat. So what is that model structure precisely? Well, um, let me quickly recall the definition of a bi-equivalence of two categories. So if we have a two functor between two categories, 
We say it's a bi-equivalence if it is surjective on objects up to equivalence. And now this word equivalence is carrying a different meaning in this phrase. So remember that anytime we have a two category, it comes with an internal notion of equivalence where a morphism from A to B is an equivalence precisely when there exists a morphism in the other direction and the globes between the composites and the identity, which are invertible. Right? This is what we call an equivalence inside of a double category. So we're saying a bi-equivalence will be surjective on objects up to one of these. And then the remaining conditions are it needs to be full on morphisms up to an invertible two morphism and fully faithful on these two morphisms. So this is the usual notion of bi-equivalence. And remember, our slogan was that anytime we have a nice class of equivalences, they should be the weak equivalences of some model structure. And this is, in fact, the case for this class. And um, Lacked proved in 2002 that there exists a model structure on 2CAD whose weak equivalences are the bi-equivalences. So this is the model structure that we uh, want to compare to. Um, just in case you know what some of these buzzwords mean, here are some very nice features of Lacks model structure. It's co-fibrantly generated. Every two category is fibrant. It has a very nifty description of the cofibrin two categories in terms of its underlying one category being free. It also has a pretty nice description of the trivial fibrations. And finally, it's monoidal with respect to the gray tensor product. So we have this monoidal product on 2CAD, which is really useful, called the gray tensor product. And the last model structure is as compatible as it needs to be with respect to this sensor product. Okay, so this is a pretty nicely behaved model structure. All right, so let's start the construction of our model structure on double cat now. And we are going to introduce this new class of weak equivalences, which we call double by equivalences. And you'll see that we're really trying to mirror the conditions for a bi-equivalence in 2CAD. So what is a double bi-equivalence? It's a double functor between double categories that satisfies the following. So first, it needs to be surjective on objects up to horizontal equivalence. So horizontal equivalence is a term that um, we introduce at least with this name and what it means. So horizontal morphism um, a horizontal morphism in a double category is a horizontal equivalence in some double category B precisely if when we look at bold HB this is now a two category and remember that bold H kept the horizontal morphisms as the morphisms, so F is still a morphism in here. And F will be a horizontal equivalence in the double category precisely if as a morphism in HB is an equivalence inside of the two category HB. Okay, so we're using our functor H to define a notion of horizontal invertibility in our double category. All right, so that will be the first of our conditions. Compare it to the first condition for bi-equivalence and it looks pretty much the same, right? Then our second condition is gonna talk about the horizontal morphisms and we're gonna claim that they are full on horizontal morphisms up to a vertically invertible square with trivial vertical morphisms. And once again, 
compare it to the second condition of bioequivalences, which was full morphisms up to invertible two cells, right? So we're changing an invertible globe like this, and we're pretty much popping open the globe with identities and having a, vert a vertically invertible square. Then our third condition is talking about the squares, and we're going to say that it's fully faithful on squares. So whenever the entire boundary of the square is in the image of the functor, then it has a unique lift. This is exactly like, uh, it looks exactly like fully faithful on two cells. And now note that I've given you conditions on objects, horizontal morphisms, and squares. Um, and I've run out of conditions to copy from the bioequivalences, but I still need to say something about the vertical morphisms, right? So I'm missing a condition talking about the vertical morphisms, and the way that we are going to come up with that is by looking at condition one over here. So for condition one, we wanted to impose a condition on objects. And the objects of the double category are exactly the objects of the two category HB. And so we impose that it's surjective up to equivalence in HB, right? That's, the con that's condition one. So for the missing condition, we want to say something about vertical morphisms of B. But like we said, the vertical morphisms of B are the objects of the two category, which we called VV. This was the shifted one, the one that uh, recorded the vertical data. So we are going to mimic our first condition and say that it needs to be surjective on vertical morphisms up to an equivalence in the two category VB. So remember that VB has as objects the vertical morphisms and as morphisms the squares. So this is a condition on squares that looks exactly like this. So we're saying it needs to be surjective on vertical morphisms up to what we call a weakly horizontally invertible square, which is precisely a square which is an equivalence as a morphism of the two category VB. Okay, so this is our proposed notion of uh, equivalence between double categories. And you can see that points one, two, and three were really, um, really similar to the conditions of bi-equivalences, but what is exactly the relation between this class of maps in double cat and the bi-equivalences in two cat. Well, one can prove that a double functor is a double bi-equivalence as we just defined, precisely if both HF and VF are equivalences in two cat. So the condition of being a, a double bi-equivalence is completely determined by looking at the images of this functor and wondering whether it's uh, by equivalence of two categories. If you allow me to rephrase this, if we take two copies of two cat, and you believe me that we can put a model structure on the product by doing everything coordinate wise, then we're saying that we consider the product functor H comma V and a double functor will be a double by equivalence precisely if it's taken to a weak equivalence by this functor H comma B. Okay, so at this point we have our candidate for our class of weak equivalences. So if we want to prove that it's a model structure, we could just go ahead and try to do it by hand. So we still need to determine a class of vibrations, a class of co-vibrations, and prove that all the axioms are satisfied. But doing this by hand uh, is often quite hard, actually. Even if you have candidates, even if you have candidates for all three classes, it's generally not trivial to prove that they satisfy everything that they need to satisfy. So instead, we take a different approach, 
And we're going to use a result that allows you to get new model structures from ones that you previously know. So let me show you what that theorem is. It's a theorem that you can, found, you can find in two papers by different combinations of these authors. And it says the following. Suppose that you start with the model category M and with some category N, and the point of the theorem is going to be to define a model structure on N, right? So suppose they are related uh, via an adjunction like this and that the following are true. So every object in the model category M needs to be vibrant. And for every object in N, we need to have a factorization of the diagonal map so that this map P here is taken by the right adjoint to a vibration in the model category M. And this map W here is taken by the right adjoint to a weak equivalent in the, excuse me, in the model category M. So if all these things are true, then the machinery of the theorem spits out a model structure on the category N whose weak equivalences are precisely the maps that are taken to a weak equivalence by the right adjoint. And same for vibrations. So this is the theorem that we are going to hope to use to define our new model structure on double cat. So obviously, the role of n is going to be played by double cat, which is the thing on which we want to build a model structure. And now we need to determine who all the other players are, because once we run double cat through the machinery of this theorem, this is going to give us some model structure on double cat determined, like we said, by the image of the right adjoint. But we don't just want to get any model structure on double cat. We want to get our model structure on double cat, which has the double by equivalences as the weak equivalences. So how do we do that? Well, if you allow me to scroll back a bit, we said that we are able to characterize double by equivalences through their image of under some functor that functor being h comma v. So since a double, since a functor is a double by equivalence, if and only if h comma v of the functor is a weak equivalence, we can come over here, set m to be 2 cat times 2 cat, set r to be this pair h comma v, and then if everything else in the theorem is true, this will give us the model structure that we're searching for. And in fact, one can prove that everything works out. So H and V each have left adjoints. So the product HV has a left adjoint given by coproduct. And uh, the rest of the hypotheses in the theorem are true. So there exists a model structure on double cat having this class of double by equivalences as its weak equivalences. Um, some buzzwords about this new model structure, it's also cofibrantly generated. It's uh, such that every double category is fibrant. We get a description of the cofibrant double categories in terms of its underlying horizontal and vertical categories, but unfortunately, it's a very asymmetric one, as you can see. A similar thing happens for the trivial vibrations. We can characterize them, but they're not exactly symmetric, right? But we, we were kind of expecting this to happen. And now, if you remember, the lag model structure was monoidal with respect to the gray tensor product on 2CAT. And there is an analog gray tensor product on double CAT, which unfortunately is not entirely compatible with our model structure. However, if you restrict one of the inputs to 2CAT via the horizontal embedding, then we do get that our model structure is 2CAT enriched with this gray tensor product. So it is not as compatible as it could be with the tensor product, but it might be compatible enough for working purposes. 
Okay, so great. Now we have constructed a model structure with this class of weak equivalences, but going back to our goal, what we wanted was for this model structure to behave nicely with respect to the horizontal embedding in a homotopical way. So let's see how far we get in achieving that goal. Well, since it was, since it was defined in a way that is completely characterized through its image uh, via this functor, it's trivially true that this adjunction is made of quillen functors, right? It's going to preserve the structure because the structure was defined as the things that are preserved. It's kind of tautological that this is a quillen pair. Um, so if we forget about uh, if we forget about the the right half of these adjoints, uh, we can get this result saying that the horizontal embedding uh, as a left adjoint gives a quillen pair. Furthermore, one can prove that the functor it induces at the level of homotopy categories is fully faithful. So in other words, this is saying that we can study the homotopy category of two cat as living inside of the homotopy category of double cat through this horizontal embedding. This is really good and this is what we were going for. But in fact, a lot more is true. You can prove that a lax model structure is left induced from our model structure through this adjunction. So remember the theorem I showed you saying, if you have an adjunction and one of them is a model category, you can push its structure to the other one. Well, now, if this is the one that you start with, then you can, then you can determine the model structure on two CAD just from our model structure on double CAD. In particular, this is saying that a, func a two functor in two CAD is a bi-equivalence if and only if the horizontal embedding HF is a double bi-equivalence. So you, you can characterize bi-equivalences through their images under this horizontal embedding. But surprisingly, even more is true. This horizontal embedding admits a left adjoint as well. And this new adjoint pair is also going to be made of quillen functors. And it's also going to induce, through this adjunction, the model structure on two categories. So let's recap to say succinctly what this all means. We have proven that there exists a model structure on double cat whose weak equivalences are this new class that we call double by equivalences. And this model structure is such that the horizontal embedding functor has the following properties. First of all, it's homotopically fully faithful, so we can study the homotopy theory of two cat inside of the homotopy theory of double cat. But furthermore, it is such that a two functor is a bi-equivalence or a fibration or a co-fibration if and only if HF is so in double cap. So not only can we study the homotopy category of two cat inside of double cat, but we can live, so the homotopy category, remember, is the localization, but we can live one level above at the level of model categories where we have more structure and even there, the model structure in 2CAD is completely determined. All three classes are determined by their, image, uh, by their images under this horizontal embedding. So uh, I believe we can see that we have achieved the best possible version of our statement that we could have hoped for. So yay yeah, yeah. us. Um, so, at this point, you might be wondering, why is this talk about two model structure? This model structure seems to be doing everything that we wanted it to do. Well, yes and no. So it is as compatible as possible with this horizontal embedding, which is really cool. But secretly, we had another hope. So one of my co-authors, Lynn Moser, 
was doing a project um, about defining a right quillin nerve functor from double categories into double infinity one categories. So she wanted to construct such a nerve functor and she wanted it to be right quillin. And in order to, for that expression to even make sense, this category right here needed to have a model structure, right? In order to talk about quillin functors. So we were hoping that our model structure will be the one to achieve this. But unfortunately, it turns out that it's a bit too asymmetric for that to actually work. If you allow me to repeat the slide with the best words about our model structure, you can see in red, the horizontal behavior, in blue, the vertical behavior, and they're unfortunately quite different, right? So this proves uh, to be an obstruction, at least for, uh, for constructing this nerve functor to infinity one double categories. So, but at this point, we were fairly convinced that our class of equivalences was a really good one. So what we set out to do was to modify our model structure. Uh, David, I'm seeing you're asking, what's an infinity one double category? I believe part of Lynn's project was to actually define that notion. Um, so I encourage you to uh, look it up on the archive. It, all the details should be there. It's probably not an easy thing to explain. Um, right, so what we set out to do was to modify our model structure so that we are able to keep our same class of weak equivalences, but tweak it just enough to make it a bit more symmetric. And the idea for how to do this is to add this map, which is the inclusion of two points into one vertical map, to the set of generating cofibrations. So you'll remember I mentioned our model structure is cofibrantly generated. What we are doing is we are adding by force an extra map to the generating class and then generating. And pretty much crossing our fingers that that will result in a model category because that's certainly not a thing that needs to happen at all. But fortunately in this case it does. So we proved that there exists another model structure on double cap with the same class of double by equivalences as their equivalences. And we're now, some of the asymmetry is fixed. For example, the trivial vibrations can be seen to be surjective on objects, full on horizontal and vertical morphisms. So this part is new and fully faithful on squares. So this is a bit more symmetric. But since it keeps the same class of weak equivalences, we can show that for homotopy theory purposes, the two model structures are the same. So uh, namely, we prove that if you consider the identity adjunction between double cat and double cap, then one of those identities uh, is a right quillin functor and one of them is a left quillin functor. And furthermore, it gives you, of course, an equivalence in the homotopy category because you're localizing by the same class, right? So for homotopy theory purposes, you are free to choose whichever one of the two is most convenient and it shouldn't make a difference. Let me give you the buzzwords about the second model structure. It's still cofibrantly generated. We do miss something good that the first one had because not every object is fibrant anymore. However, we do identify in our fibrant objects a really neat class of double categories, and these are called um, weakly horizontally invariant. So these are the double categories such that whenever you have a diagram like this, where A and A prime are horizontal equivalences, you can fill it to a diagram like this with a vertical morphism U and a weakly horizontally invertible square. So pretty much our class of fibrant objects are those double categories for which you can lift vertical morphisms along equivalences. 
Um, and we are going to come back to this class of double categories uh, at the end of the talk. So we get a characterization of its co of the cofibrin objects, and you can see now that it's completely symmetric. Like we said, we can characterize the trivial vibrations, and the description is also very symmetric. And finally, this tweak that we did fixed the missing compatibility with the gray tensor product. So this second model structure is monoidal with the gray tensor product in double cap. But now the thing was, we still do have in mind our same goal of it behaving properly with the horizontal embedding. <clears throat> so how well does it do on that point? Well, we can still prove that the horizontal embedding as the left adjoint gives a pair of quillin functors now with our second model structure on double cap. And furthermore, that the derived functor is fully faithful. So it's still true that one can study the homotopy theory of 2CAT inside of this other homotopy theory. However, it's not the fact, unfortunately, that H is the right quillin functor. Um, so one of the things, uh, remember I said right quillin functors need to preserve the class called vibrations. So in particular, it needs to preserve what we call the fibrant objects. But what are the fibrant, what are the fibrant objects in 2CAT? These are all. Um, so if we have a 2 category A, we send it to the double category HA. And the question is, is this fibrant? Meaning, is this weakly horizontally invariant in the sense that it lifts vertical morphisms along equivalences? And this is very much not the case. So whenever the two category has even a single equivalence, let's say we have an equivalence in the two category that we now see as a horizontal morphism in HA, we can consider this diagram, and this will never be filled here. This will never be filled because in HA, we only have identities as vertical morphisms. So as long as one equivalence pops up inside of our two category, we are done. This will never be true. So, um, what we can do is we can tweak the horizontal embedding a little bit as well. And we can consider a more homotopical version of it. So remember the horizontal embedding, what it does is it takes the globes and it pops them open to squares with the qualities on the sides. So we define this new functor H tilde having the same object the same horizontal morphisms, but now instead of popping open the globes with identities, we're gonna allow it to pop them open with equivalences in the vertical direction. So we will have one vertical morphism for each choice of adjoint equivalence data. And the squares uh, are going to be given by the two cells between the composites. So we call it a more homotopical version because it's now including the data of equivalences, right? And this H tilde functor emits a left adjoint in such a way that these are now quillin functors. So H tilde is a right quillin functor in our new model structure. It's also homotopically fully faithful, so it still achieves our purpose. And furthermore, uh, the model structure on 2CAT is also induced through this adjunction. So a two-functor is a biequivalence if and only if H tilde F is a double biequivalence, and the same for vibrations. And furthermore, this homotopical horizontal embedding comes to correct the failure of the horizontal embedding in the following way. So remember, we said when A is a two category, it will most often be the case that HA is not fibrant. However, H tilde A will always be fibrant. 
And we will always have this inclusion of HA into H tilde A, which will be a double by equivalence. So in model category fancy words, we are saying this exhibits H tilde A as a fibrin replacement of HA in our new model structure. All right then, so here is a quick comparison of our two model structures. Um, and you can see that they both have their pros and cons. So remember, the, the idea is that since they're both quillin equivalent, they are both the same for homotopy theory purposes, so you can pick whichever is, mo is most convenient. <clears throat> and that will really depend on what you're trying to do. For example, uh, this one has everything fibrant, which is a very desirable thing to have. The fibrant cofibrin objects are usually the nice ones. So the more of them you're, you have, the better. Um, however, this one does have symmetric descriptions in here. It is monoidal, while the other one is only enriched, unfortunately. But this one does have the better behavior with the H functor. So it really depends on what you're after, uh, which one will be most convenient. All right, so to wrap things up, um, what I want to do now is I want to leave our initial motivation aside, let's say we've fulfilled that goal, and now we want to study this class of equivalences just for their own sake. So we do believe that this is an interesting class of equivalences between double categories, and hopefully these slides are going to show some evidence for that claim. So recall that in CAT, a functor is an equivalence, meaning surjective on objects up to ISO and fully faithful, if and only if there exists a functor going the other way, together with natural isomorphisms between the identity and the composites, right? This is the classical um, equivalent characterizations of equivalences of categories. In a similar way, in 2CAT, we have that a two-functor is a bi-equivalence, meaning surjective on objects up to equivalence, full on morphisms up to invertible two-cell, and fully faithful on two cells. If and only if there exists a pseudo-functor going the other way, together with pseudo-natural equivalences between the identity and the composites. So it's not super important if you recall exactly what the pseudo part means. It's just making things a little bit more lax. But what I do want to highlight is the similarity between these two scenarios, right? Like the, the equivalences in each of these two settings seem to have a very similar behavior. These two results are sometimes called the whitehead theorems because they are categorical versions of the classical, meaning the topological Whitehead theorem, which let me uh, recall what it said, it tells you that a morphism between CW complexes is a weak homotopy equivalence, meaning inducing isos on all homotopy groups, precisely if there exists a morphism going the other way, which is um, an inverse up to homotopy. So we can see that these uh, two versions that we just saw in CAD and double in 2CAD are kind of uh, exhibiting the same behavior, right? So the nice thing about our class of equivalences is that not only do um, does its definition mirror that of bi-equivalence in three out of its four conditions. But furthermore, we can also get a similar characterization in terms of an inverse. Um, this will require an extra condition on the double categories involved. However, we don't get it for all of them. But if A and B are double categories such that either A is weakly horizontally invariant, meaning vibrant in our second model structure, or that B has no composites of vertical morphisms. This is going to be true for all the cofibrant categories. 
then we do get that a double functor is a double y equivalence precisely if there exists a double pseudo functor going the other way and horizontal pseudo natural equivalences between the composites and the identities. So we see this as evidence of this really capturing something interesting in double categories, right? Because this is, I believe, the closest that there is to getting such a characterization on a category of, uh, on a class of equivalences between double categories. So we do believe that aside from our goal of the, of the infinity nerve and of comparing it with the lab model structure, this does seem to be capturing something important, which, uh, yeah, we look forward to study more about this. Um, so thank you all for your time. Thank you so much for the talk, it was very nice. Okay, who has any questions? Uh, please feel free to raise your hand or write in the chat. So in the meantime, because there uh, may be some offline questions, let me give you the link for Zulip. So it's posting it here in the chat. And to access that, you need an invitation link that I'll give you in a second. Right here. Okay. Can I ask you a question? Sure, yes. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, so that was really wonderful uh, talk. Um, so I'm wondering if, uh, so there's a strictification theorem for uh, double categories that says every like vertically weak double category is is by equivalent to a um, vertically strict double category. Um, so, uh, but but that doesn't extend to uh, double functors. So I'm wondering, uh, can you use these model structures to help with that deficiency where you may have strictified? Um, can you use sort of the language of of model category theory to help you figure out where the rest of your uh, double functors are. I, I believe that you should. Um, so this is something that we have pending, but um, in the in the lab model structure on 2CAD, you can use the cofibrin objects to identify these kind of straightenings of functors. Uh, and we have no reason to expect anything different in this scenario. So we would entirely hope that to be true. Yes. Thanks. Nice. Are there any more questions? Okay, seems that there are no online questions for the moment. Um, feel free to ask them in the Zulip thread if you come up with anything or anything that was not clear. So for now, uh, let's thank the speaker again. And thanks, Mario. Well, there he has a... Oh, we do have a question from Valeria. Okay, please. Um, Valeria, feel free to unmute yourself and ask directly if you want. Um, I try to unmute myself first. Uh, yeah, you're, you're live, yeah. No, I'm okay. Um, I'm allowed. Um, thank you for, for, this, for the talk. I, I actually am very confused and I was a bit late, so maybe you kind of talked a bit about that when I was, before I joined in. But I, I wanted to know, I mean, you kind of, kept comparing to the lack uh, sort of um, uh, theorems and his model structure. And I, I still haven't understood why you started thinking that you needed a different one. I mean, I can see that the, 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 you know, it's a nice table that you put at the end comparing the two mm -hmm. kind of structure. But, but, you know, I wanted to know what kind of, set you off into the direction of finding another one, given that there was all this lack structure kind of 
present already. Right. So the lamp model structure is present on two cat, so the category of two categories. Um, right. And the one that we define is on double cat, the category double, right. of double category. So right. it is true that there were other model structures. So there's there's no lack model structure for double cat. Or perhaps mm -hmm. one could argue that this is the closest to a lack model structure on double cat. Um, but the other mm -hmm. model structures on double cat that existed, which I mentioned, um, let me just leave you with the references in case you want to look at them. They were um, they were with a categorical point of view. So these other model structures are related to cat in very like in various ways, but they are none of them are related to two cat. So they capture one categorical equivalences either in the underlying horizontal category, underlying vertical, in many different, way, different ways. They have plenty of different model structures, but none of them really see by equivalences at all. So that's, that was our motivation. There are plenty of model structures on double cat that agree or that see the homotopy uh, theory of cat. And we felt that there should also be one that saw the homotopy theory of two cat as given by lack. Um, but why? Um, okay. I mean, what do you want about the, the, the two category? structure in this case i mean what are we going to do with this stuff well um so something that was done is the uh the paper that i mentioned uh from my collaborator lynn moser where she constructed this new um nerve for double categories to infinity one double categories and there already existed such a nerve for two categories and we and she shows that with our model structure this whole thing this whole thing behaves as it should so it agrees with the previously existing construction for the two cat nerve uh, via the horizontal embedding but um we so we were also thinking that it could be helpful since as i mentioned at some point in the talk i think here um it's sometimes useful from a categorical point of view to look at two categories as horizontal double categories because the extra structure that you have in double categories, you can leverage that extra structure sometimes to give you ni a nicer behavior. Um, for example, there's this example of this, um, the, this two limit statement not holding in two cat, which is a statement that I suppose naively you would guess it would hold, uh, but it's, it doesn't. However, if you pass to double categories, then it does. So there's evidence that categorically this is a useful thing to do. And I suppose we have the hope that the same thing can, can be done homotopically. I see. Okay, that's that's great. Thank you very much. That's good. Nice, thanks. Okay, even more questions? Yep. Okay, seems there's none. Uh, again, feel free to ask any offline questions on Zulip. And uh, let's thank Mario again for a nice talk.